we're even called to. Hello. I know, I know, I'm here. Welcome to the Daily Briefing. Two quick items at the top, and then happy to open it up to your questions. First, on Libya. As we congratulate the Libyan people on yesterday's elections and taking an important step toward advancing a free, prosperous, democratic, and secure Libya, we also condemn in the strongest terms the senseless and brutal murder of Libyan human rights activist Salwa Bougages, as, as we condemn all terror, violence, and intimidation in Libya. We mourn Salwa's death with her family and with all Libyans. She was a courageous woman and a true Libyan patriot. She was an advocate for political prisoners during the Qaddafi regime, an organizer of demonstrations against the regime during the February 17, 2011 revolution, a political activist, and an original member of the Transitional National Council after the uprising began. Salwa resigned in protest over the absence of women's voices in the council, but continued to play an active and powerful role supporting democracy, human rights, and the participation of women in Libyan politics until she was murdered on the day she and other Libyans went to the polls to elect a new government. Her voice will live on, fighting for the causes that inspired her and will mean so much for all Libyans as well. Second item at the top. On Ukraine, today marks one month since Russia-backed backed, excuse me, Russia -backed separatists kidnapped four OSCE special monitoring mission observers in eastern Ukraine. Three days later, separatists abducted another four OSCE observers. These eight international observers continue to be held hostage. OSCE monitors are in Ukraine to observe and report the facts impartially. We condemn these abductions and call on Russia, indeed itself a member of the OSCE, to use its influence with the separatists to secure the immediate release of the monitors and to guarantee the security of the OSCE monitoring teams. With that, okay, let's try to make this up. one quick. Yep. Um, on Ukraine, earlier today, as you are well aware, the secretary met with um, French Foreign Minister um, Fabius. Fabius. Yes. Uh, and he, uh, I'm curious if you can extrapolate a little bit or elaborate a little bit on his, what he meant when he said that Russia mm -hmm. has hours, literally hours, yep. to, um, to basically show goodwill, to, to move to disarm the separatists. What, uh, hours is less than days, clearly. <laughs> what, what exactly happens if they don't meet this hours, well, a, a couple points deadline. on timing. The week-long ceasefire expires tomorrow. So that's partly what was driving the secretary when he was talking about timing. Also, the European Council is meeting tomorrow to discuss, among other things, uh, say possible additional sanctions against Russia. Uh, we've been very clear uh, that we remain prepared to impose additional sanctions, including sectoral, should circumstances warrant. Uh, I think there were some questions about this the other day, but the March 20th executive order authorizes the Secretary of the Treasury to sanction any individual or entity determined to operate in such sectors as, of the Russian economy uh, that we would want to sanction. So we have in place the infrastructure to do this very quickly uh, if we want to. The Secretary wasn't outlining specific timing for additional sanctions, but uh, underscoring the need that this needs to happen quickly. Um, Including well, partly because of the ceasefire expiring tomorrow. Right. There has been discussion on both sides about extending the ceasefire. There has been. That's still something you're supportive of. Uh, we, it, as long as the parties uh, that have signed up to it abide by it. So right. yes, if, of course, if we could get an extension that people uh, abide by, that would be a good ha thing. Have the, have the parties to date abided by the ceasefire? Some of them have and some of them haven't. Some of the separatists have, uh, some of the separatists have not. What, but the Ukrainian government? The Ukrainian government has uh, abided by the terms of the ceasefire. The only time they have taken action is after they have themselves been attacked. All right. And, but it, it, given this, what the Secretary said in terms of hours, literally, it is, is it not more likely that the sanctions would come later today or tomorrow, given the fact that the ceasefire expires? I don't have any predictions for you on timing. But he wasn't <coughs> going to discuss the timing of sanctions with he that was comment. Not. He was not. No. I mean, in general, we've said we could do it very quickly. But no, he was not talking about anything specifically. Can I ask you a couple of follow-ups on this? Uh -huh. um, is the United States, as it has done in the past, willing to move forward on additional sanctions on Russia without the European Union if they do not vote for such sanctions? Well, uh, in general, as you know, we've remained very coordinated with them on the sanctions. I think that's important to do, but you know we make sanctions decisions on our own based on our own economy and our own interests. 
Uh, but again, believe that they're strongest when they're in partnership with each other. But you reserve the right to do it on your own if you feel necessary? Certainly, but obviously we've remained coordinated with them because we think it's important to do them together. The, the authorities uh, under the previous exec under the executive order that mm -hmm. you referenced, um, I think are, and, and as you read them, are targeting individuals and companies, correct? So they authorize the Secretary of the Treasury to sanction any individual or entity uh, determined to operate in such sectors of the Russian Federation economy as may be determined by, again, the Secretary in consultation with the Secretary of State. These sectors uh, include financial services, energy, metals and mining, engineering, or defense or related material. Okay, and um, the pings are from Europe that they're not going to go forward um, tomorrow. Although well, we've obviously been talking to them, and I think we just need to wait and see what uh, happens tomorrow. Yeah. Chief, yeah. <coughs> I have one more on Ukraine, actually. Okay. Um, today, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers took out a full-page mm -hmm. ad in three leading U.S. publications. I wanted to know if you had any comment on that. They did. Uh, so, since the beginning of the crisis in Ukraine, uh, we have had frequent conversations with business leaders uh, in the business community uh, on this issue to explain exactly our policy and, and understand their concerns. And in general, our sanctions policy towards Russia has been designed to maximize uh, the pressure and the impact on Russia while minimizing the impact on the West and the United States economy as well. So uh, we're trying to do things to change Russia's decision making, obviously in a very strategic and targeted way that increases the pressure on them while again not, you know, doing so in a way that doesn't come back on us. So we've had those conversations with the business community since the beginning of this crisis. And you're still continuing to have those conversations we with are. them? We are. And yes. the, well, so that, does that mean that the business community is aware of the sanction, of what the sanctions are? that have already been put in place? No, the ones that are potentially coming. We don't discuss uh, with anyone outside of the government what sanctions might be coming for obvious reasons in the future. What I've said in our discussions, we've talked to the business community about what we've already put in place and our overall strategic goal for how we decide on sanctions. Well, that doesn't seem to make, if you're trying to minimize the impact on American companies, it would seem to be, not, it would not seem to make sense not to tell them what you're thinking about. There's for plenty the, of people in inside this government that do the calculations about minimizing the risk to our companies and our economy. Obviously, there are good reasons not to tell people outside of the government what sanctions might be coming, because if someone were to find out they might be coming, they could take steps to move their assets around. So that's why we keep that private and internal. But we have the discussions with the business community in general uh, about this issue. No, no, no. I'm not talking about sanctions that you would impose on Russian individuals, but, but sectoral sanctions that might limit U.S. companies' ability to do business in Russia. Well, we talk in general about the concept and how it might uh, impact our economy. That's certainly true, but we don't specifically talk about new sanctions that might be coming specifically in terms of what individuals or what companies with folks outside of the government. It's my understanding that some of the sanctions that are in the, you know, ready Pipeline. to get ready to mm -hmm. go, uh, if and when a decision made, would in impact. Um, U.S. companies doing uh, doing business in uh, well, in Russia. We're considering a, a wide range of sanctions but, and don't have any comment on the specifics of what they might. Uh, okay, impact. I'm not, but I'm not even talking about the specifics. I just, but if you, if you don't consult with businesses, we're consulting with them, obviously, well, in but, general about the concept, Matt. But there are very good reasons not to tell people uh, outside of the government what specific sanctions we're going to put in place. Well, then I don't see how that minimizes the dam minimizes. There the are a lot of people US inside companies. this government who can do very good calculations about how potential sanctions might impact U.S. companies or U.S. the U.S. Well, economy, and they do those calculations, and we take them into account when we're deciding what additional sanctions to put in place. Right. Well, yeah, but who knows better how a specific sanction is going to affect I, I, a U.S. company than that company itself? The well, again, we have people who are very good at looking at that inside the Department of the Treasury, I, and, and we have good reasons not to discuss specifics with people okay, outside. Well, sure do you want Russian oligarchs five... moving assets around because they might no. accidentally find out it's coming? No, no, no. I'm not talking about. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about ru the, the impact on. on on Russians or telling them that, you know, person X in Russia is going to be affected. But if there are sanctions that are going to impact the U.S. company's ability to do business in Russia, which I am led to believe there are in the pipeline, um, it strikes me as a bit unusual that you wouldn't talk to the companies about what 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 could possibly be coming so that they could we protect themselves. We talk in general about what possibly I might be coming. But it's just saying that the, there are people in the government who know, you're, you're suggesting that people in the government in government know better 
I'm not about, saying that, Matt. I, look, you're taking us down a rabbit hole here. I, I don't want to, especially I know, but, today. But you but are. I, but wait, but, let me finish up with one point. We talked to them in general. I just read a bunch of sectors, right? right? We talked to them in general about what those might look like and how they might impact the American economy and American companies. Those discussions can be very robust without saying, on X date, we're going to sanction X company. Because there are very good reasons we don't give that information out to people. But we are very, we have very robust discussions about ways to minimize the impact. We really do. Okay. Yes. On Ukraine? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, ma'am, as far as sanctions against Russia is concerned, are you in touch with other countries other than the NATO or uh, Europeans like China and uh, India and other countries? We've been in touch with a wide range of countries on this issue. Uh, I don't have a full list in front of me, but I I'm happy to see if there's more specific. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah? Uh, yeah Iraq? Uh -huh. yes, today, Prime Minister Maliki claimed that the, his government forces are re taking back the initiative. First of all, do you agree? And second, is this attributable to, uh, let's say, U.S. advisors on the ground, Iranian boots on the ground, or the Syrian airstrikes, or all three, in your opinion? Well, say the situation on the ground remains very fluid. And uh, to be very clear, Iraq's security situation uh, cannot and should not be resolved uh, by the Assad regime, by airstrikes from the Assad regime, or by militias funded and supported by other countries in the region stepping in. What we really need to see is the army get back on its feet. We have folks there trying to help these elite units do that uh, and, and start to retake territory. But the situation on the ground is still very serious. So you agree that these elements coming together may have affected the situation I, on the I, ground? I didn't say that. I said actually the opposite, that it's, the security situation can't be resolved <coughs> by the Assad regime. Cannot be. Cannot, correct. <laughs> that that's not the situation uh, that we need to see here in Iraq. That what we need to see is political leaders step up and military leaders step up, uh, bring the army back together, push back, with help from us, of course. Uh, but, but look, the situation on the ground remains very serious, very fluid, and there are still huge security challenges for the Iraqi forces. Seeing how uh, the meeting, uh, the planned meeting between Secretary Kay and the King of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. after he met with the Saudi Foreign Minister, is it, are we likely to see uh, an American request or an American demand that the Saudis cease their support to ISIL? Well, as I said yesterday, we don't have evidence that any government is supporting I ISIL in the region. So I want to be very clear about that when we're talking about funding. Um, we've worked very closely with the Saudis and other partners in the region who are very concerned about the security situation in Iraq. Uh, they don't uh, uh, want to see uh, what's happening in Iraq. They understand the terrorist threat as well. The Saudis have, uh, have suffered it at the hands of terrorists for many years. So. Uh, we'll have the conversation, Secretary Will, tomorrow with King Abdullah. The President asked him to go to update him on his meetings there. And again, we're, we're in this fight together uh, for the sake of Iraq and encouraging Saudis and other regional partners to use their influence with different parts uh, of the Iraqi leadership uh, to push them to all come together uh, to form an inclusive government as soon as possible and help Iraq get back on its feet. So you mentioned us, the Iraqi uh -huh. government, to, but you don't want anyone else to help them? Or well, is there any kind of assistance that anyone could give here needs to be towards the goal of okay. a inclusive government. And are you specifically referring to Iran? Well, any any assistance. And we've so said you're that not necessarily opposed to Assad helping them as long as it meets your criteria for not inflaming the sectarian I, I'm not sure how anything the Assad regime do, could do could, could be anything other than inflaming sectarian uh, tensions, okay. to be clear. But, so. but you don't feel the same way about Iran? No, uh, look. Not, Iran could play a positive role, but Syria, Assad's Syria well, cannot. Well, anything that Iran or anyone else um, should be doing in Iraq uh, should not be sectarian in any nature, and anything that were to be sectarian would be very problematic. So we're watching right now certainly what the Iranians are doing there. Uh, you know, we've all seen the reports, and, and I can't confirm them, but we've seen the reports, and, and we would not support anything that was sectarian in nature. So while we may have a common enemy, we don't always have the same strategic sure. interests. I, I understand that. But, yeah. but, but you don't think that Assad at all, regardless of what, what he says he's doing or regardless of what he actually does, is able to play a helpful role here? But Iran is. I'm just trying to make a well, distinction. Well, I'm. You, I'm trying to find out. You're trying if to make you it make, very black and white. Well, I'm trying to find out if you, if the United States believes there's a distinction between Iranian help and Syrian help. I think there's a distinction, and let me see if I can explain this in the right way. Iran could play a constructive role if it did things to promote an inclusive government. I'm not saying they have done those things, but they could. Okay. Um, that is very different 
than an Assad regime who was responsible in large part for the rise and strength of ISIL, who has uh, created a security situation where ISIL could, could flourish mm -hmm. and, uh, and now uh, may be taking some action. I have no reason to believe that they're not. Um, that's not in any way helpful to Iraq's security. Okay, but you could not repeat that sentence, Iran could play a helpful role with by, replace Iran with Syria, saying Syria. I mean, I guess Assad everything's could... possible in a hypothetical, Matt. But okay. we're, they're uh, very different situations. Could you repeat something that you said? You said we have we share a common enemy, but we don't share. But we may common not purpose. No, I you gotta no. gotta listen, Said. Okay, I said I, I, I know you are. No, I said we may share a common enemy. Look, we all understand the threat from ISIL, including the Iranians. That doesn't necessarily mean we have a shared strategic interest. Right. Um, we would like everyone to, because we think that's what's in the best interest of Iraq. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and I know you're listening. You listen better than most in this room, so. Maliki, yes. Maliki confirmed to BBC that uh, Syrian uh, air forces bombed mm -hmm. the area in uh, Iraq. Can you confirm that today? Well, as I said yesterday, I don't have reason to believe it's not the case. I think the Prime Minister Maliki probably has uh, the most up-to-date information on that. But again, this isn't what we need to see for Iraq going forward. Um, we know, look, any action that, that hinders ISIL's ability to move is, you know, tactically may be a good thing, but strategically, um, this is not what needs to happen to get Iraq back in a better place. Right. Yeah, Elliot. Sorry, there are reports from Baghdad that uh, reprisal killings against Sunnis are becoming more and more frequent. Is the U.S. doing anything at this time to, to try and prevent this from becoming more of an issue than it already is? Well, we are following we, the reports um, closely, certainly. Uh, we've seen execution-style killings of thousands of Iraqi soldiers, policemen, uh, government leaders, also some of the ethnic uh, uh, minorities and religious minority populations as well. So we are working with our international partners very closely to see how we can deal with this sort of what I would call an, emer an even worsening humanitarian situation. Uh, we're working uh, with the Iraqi government to help on this also with the UN as well. So we're monitoring it. And obviously that's, I think, um, just underscores the notion that Iraq's political leaders need to form a government as soon as possible, bring the country together, and use their influence to, to try and stop some of this. This might be better addressed to DOD, but do you have any, are you aware of any um, specific role that U.S. Special Forces are playing in that regard as they try to train? In you know, it's a good question. Let me check with my colleague. You could check with them. I can sure. check with them as well and see if they are. I, I know that the folks they've sent in are in it uh, at the moment an assessment role uh, working with the Army about the ISIL threat, but let me see if, if there's more I can share. Thank yes, you. Matt. Sud yeah. Sudan. Mm -hmm. um, so the reports are that um, uh, Mrs. Ibrahim, Ibrahim has been released. Do you know uh, do you have any details on this? So before oh, I came out, released. again, this is a very fluid situation and things are happening every minute here, but uh, before I came out, it was our understanding that she was still at the police station, which was where she was being held uh, this morning, D.C. time. Uh, again, very fluid situation, so I can't confirm these reports that she has been released. Uh, we are in communication with the Sudanese Foreign Ministry to ensure that she and her family will be free to travel as quickly as possible. Uh, again, she had been detained while issues related to her travel and identification documents were sorted out. Uh, and from our perspective, uh, Miriam has all of the documents she needs to travel to and enter the United States. Uh, it's up to the government of Sudan to allow her to exit the country. As I said, we're working with them on that right now. Okay. Well, from our perspective, can you just can you eliminate that and just say she has the travel document, valid travel documents? And uh, again. We're working with the government of Sudan can you, on that. Can, do, would, are you hopeful that she'll be able to get out today? Uh, uh, we're hopeful and, that she'll be able to get out soon. I just don't want to predict. And would you, you expect her destination when she does leave to be the United States? Well, I don't have anything specific, but as I just said, we, uh, uh, in terms of our perspective, she has the necessary documents she needs to travel to the United States. Does that mean she has a visa to enter the United I States? I don't have more specifics for you on what documents, what those documents might look like. Why, why not, just out of curiosity? Because uh, we don't always give out those specific details <laughs> for a variety of reasons, some of which are privacy, some of which are bureaucratic. I don't always share those, but I gave you a new line today on travel documents, so. <laughs> a new topic? Yeah. So the South Korean milita military today said that um, North Korea launched four projectiles into the Sea of Japan. Yes. Um, th today, does this raise concerns that North Korea is increasing its provocations? Well, I think we're always concerned whenever North Korea launches anything. I think that's probably fair to say. 
And we are aware of, I think, three projectiles. Did you say three or four? I'm sorry. I don't believe it's being reported as three. Okay, right. So the, the, the North Korea launched three projectiles from its southeast coast. Uh, we're monitoring the situation, and we're still evaluating the available information to identify the exact type of projectile that may have been launched. And assuming that they did launch these projectiles, would this be a violation of UN um, it, resolutions? It depends. It depends on what they were. Technically, obviously, any launch of anything is problematic. Uh, is escalatory in nature, uh, is threatening. So obviously we wouldn't agree with any launch, but in terms of the technicality, it depends on what they were. Yeah? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. One more North Korea. Um, one question, I, I realize that the North Korea has a very different system of freedom of speech and different uh, ideas on that than the United States. But the North Koreans... That's the understatement of the day, I think. <laughs> uh, the North Koreans calling on the United States to ban the film, uh, the interview. I was um, wondering why I didn't get this yesterday. I was surprised. Um, do you have a response to that? You know, I, I, I really don't. Um, they, I think, had fairly, a fairly strong reaction to it. And really, I think I'm going to steer clear of commenting on it. Um, not to my knowledge, but I'm happy to check. Um, you know, I just, I don't think I have any analysis to do on that. A quick question. Any observations of why the North Koreans might be so upset about this? Does it show that more outside information is seeping in? You know, it, it's a good question. I'm happy to check with our folks. I just don't know the answer. Quick yes. question on Israel. Uh -huh. Apparently today, uh, Foreign Minister Abigador Lieberman, during his meeting with Secretary Kerry, suggested that Israel would help moderate Arab countries to fight ISIL. Is this something that the United States would look uh, kindly on or would encourage Israel to do? Well, or uh, would advise against Just a quick, a quick little readout of that meeting. They talked mm -hmm. about um, the long-term relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians. They obviously talked about the missing Israeli teenagers, and Secretary reiterated his concern uh, over, over the missing teenagers. They also talked about Iraq and ISIL, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they had, you know, really a discussion about the longer-term threat coming from some of these groups. And we welcome anyone in the region who is willing uh, to stand up and, and help fight the threat that ISIL poses. Again, really when it comes to Iraq, though, this is a fight the Iraqis need to take on themselves uh, through their army and through their capabilities. Well, how can you say that you welcome anyone in the region and then tell Assad that he can't? Assad, uh, when, when you anyone brutally massacre... Assad, anyone, anyone other than Assad is welcome to help him? Look, if Assad were to stop killing his own people, to stop using barrel bombs, to lay down his weapons and agree to a transitional governing body, sure, we can have that discussion. I'll, I'll, I will wait for that to happen. Yeah. One question on Iraq. Uh-huh. You, you said any help is welcome as long as it is not based on sectarian consideration. Right. It needs to all be in the service of an inclusive government. Is, is any Iranian help, could it be anything else but sectarian? <laughs> well, uh, you know, we judge... Uh, actions by, by each one specifically, and again, I don't have all the details on what may or may not be going on, but, uh, you know, we know the history there, but again, I don't have more details to share from what Iran is doing. Yes? Uh, another issue. What are you next? Yeah. Uh, Madam, as far as uh, security in South Asia is concerned, it depends on all stability in Pakistan. Innocent Pakistani, Pakistanis are being killed every day, and there is a civil and political unrest mm -hmm. going on in the country. And also now jihadis, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban are now standing up against the innocent Pakistanis that they will wage war against uh, Pakistan if the military operation continues against them in Pakistan uh, and all that. My question is that India is also worried, and also because you have a in, uh, strategic interest in next door neighbor in Afghanistan. So, how U.S. is helping, or has Pakistan asked for U.S. help? Well, you asked a lot about a lot there. So, let me just address a few quick points, and then I, I'm going to Arshad next. Uh, look, we've worked very closely with the Pakistanis. The threat from uh, the Taliban and other terrorist groups is not new. Uh, we've worked with them very closely. It doesn't just threaten the Pakistanis; it threatens. Afghanistan and India and has the United States in the past as well. In terms of the current operations Pakistan is undertaking in North Waziristan, this is an entirely led, a Pakistani-led and executed operation. Uh, obviously, we uh, have long supported their efforts to extend the writs of government throughout their country and to increase internal uh, stability and security. But again, these are these current operations are an entire Pakistani-led event. Thank you. Arshad. Yeah, just a, a quick one. Can you give us uh, 
just a succinct, simple description of the main issues that you expect the Secretary and King Abdullah to discuss tomorrow. Iraq, Syria, clean and succinct enough for you? Um, oil. I'm sure. Iran. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they will as well. So, you know, obviously the ISIL threat in Iraq, uh, how we're working with the Iraqis on this, uh, what the conversations the Secretary had in Iraq were like. Uh, when it comes to Syria, uh, you know, we've said we will continue increasing our support to the opposition. I think we'll have conversations about that. Uh, next week we start uh, the next round of the P5 plus one talks with Iran over its nuclear program. I'm sure there will be mention of that. I'm, oil is always a topic of conversation, but I can't predict whether it will come up, but uh, frequently does. And lastly, um, would you expect, regardless of what the Secretary might say about this, mm -hmm. that the issue of ISIL uh, financing will come up? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to predict. As I said, we don't have any information that the government is, is no, no. has supported from a funding perspective. Um, I, you know, we'll see if it does. I don't want to predict. Obviously, it's something we're worried about. Thank you. Yes, last one. In the raw, I got you very Okay, much. okay. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, Madam, yesterday at the Carnegie, experts were discussing about the new government of Narendra Modi in India and mm -hmm. the U.S.-India relations. What they were discussing was the India and the new government now needs a massive investment to go forward and move forward the country because the 60 years, corruption and all those things were going on. Mm -hmm. My question is here, so many uh, things going on between the two countries, official visits to India and all that. During these visits, uh, have you been discussing about the massive investment in India? Well, we've certainly, and I think this is what you're asking about, we certainly talk quite a bit about uh, the uh, economic relationship with India, whether it's investing in certain parts of its economy, whether it's increasing uh, exports and imports and private sector trade. That's certainly been a key part of our discussions with the government of India, not just uh, since Mr. Modi uh, has been in office, but before that for a long time as well. Um, yeah, um, staying on India. Okay, oh. stay on India. Oh. Yeah. Uh, today in Lahore, uh, <coughs> JUD Chief Hafiz Saeed said that if the U.S. can do whatever it wants, don't care, they should prove if they have proof. And then the for Pakistani Foreign Office spokesperson, Tasneem uh, Aslam, said that Pakistan is not under any obligation because it's from U.S. and not from U.N. Are you referring to the yesterday's, yesterday's re well, the sanction or the uh, designations that we've had on LAT have been in place for some time now, uh, for years. And yesterday, what we did was add additional aliases to uh, make sure that we can increasingly cut off the funding and support to LAT through other these other aliases that they use for their activities as well. And look, we've been very clear about the threat LAT poses. No, but and we have shared information uh, from our assessment about the attack in Herat with the Indian. No, but the government has also. Yes. yes. So Pakistan is under obligation to implement that? Uh, I, I'm happy to check with our UN team about those specifics. No, but uh, when the foreign sec uh, sp office spokesperson says that uh, no obligation from the U.S., uh, it's a partner state. So wh wh what have you Well, spoken? I haven't seen those comments, and I don't want to get into a tit-for-tat with my counterpart in Pakistan um, without seeing them. So let me check. Obviously, we've made very clear our concern about LET. That's why we put them on our designation list. That's why we try to cut off funding and support to them. Um, let, me, let me check on those comments, and I'm happy to see if there's more to share. I want to f uh, know uh, two very brief ones. Yeah. Uh, Egypt, if there's any uh, anything new on uh, in terms of contacts with the Egyptians about nothing the, new. We've been in continual contact with them, but nothing new to highlight. And then no deliveries, no deliveries, no, additional no, material. Nothing has changed there. No. And then um, making good on my promise from yesterday. Do you have anything uh, to say about uh -oh. your position on the Excuse renaming me. of the street? Okay. Yeah. So see, um, well. Much to your dismay, I am not going to take a position on the naming of the street, um, but I will say a few things about this gentleman. Uh, the secretary put out a statement, I believe it was December 9th, 2013, marking the fifth anniversary of this Nobel laureate and writer's detention, uh, have called very clearly uh, for his release from the Chinese authorities to end his wife's house arrest and to guarantee him and his family members all internationally recognized human rights protections and freedoms. So clearly, uh, we think this uh, gentleman has played an important role uh, in advancing uh, dialogue, and uh, I think we'll probably leave it at that. Which well, um, So the person they want to name the street after 
You want me to try and pronounce it? Is that what you're trying to get me to do? I'm just trying to. I'm wondering if you're not willing to say the name. No, I. Oh no no no! I just didn't okay. want to mispronounce oh, okay. it. Okay. It's Lu right. Xiao Bao. Yeah. So. So. Um, My pronunciations aren't always the best. So. I, 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 so in yeah. general, what I'm saying is, look, I'm not taking a position on the legislation. Clearly, we think uh, that he, this person has been a, a, a voice, uh, should be released uh, from prison, his wife's house arrest should end, making very clear our feelings on him. I don't want that to be uh, caught up in the confusion of the fact that we won't take a position on this legislation. So you won't take a position on the legislation? I, I will not from here at this time, no. But, but the administration will and has? Publicly, we're not taking a position on it at this time. Uh, well, it, it, well, will there come a, will there come a time when you will take a public? Uh, given the fact that this this, this often, this street as you know, with legislation, a, we don't take positions for some time, and then we eventually do. Right, but given the fact that this is this street is under federal, you know, it's the federal government street. Mm -hmm. uh, you have jurisdiction over it. I would think that you would have an, an, an interest and an, an interest that shouldn't. That there's no reason for it to be a private position. Well, we're having those conversations with Congress. Again, I'm happy to take your uh, advice so about the fact that we should make those public so facts you, about You believe that, that, that this guy should be released, but you're yes. not necessarily, but you won't say whether you think he should be, whether it's appropriate to. For a street to be named after him. Yep. Any street anywhere? <laughs> I don't think I have any more on the street. I mean, no look. Street. So it sounds like you don't support. That's not what I said. I did not at all say well, that. Well, if you're questioning the appropriateness of a street being named after him. I didn't say him. that. I didn't question I said I'm taking no position on whether or not the street should be named after him at well, all. Do you know if the Chinese have, have made their public complaint to you guys um, in, in, I can check. I, I, do, I don't know. Well, without taking a position on the legislation, do you think that such a move could aggravate your relationship with the Chinese? Well, I think by definition that would mean I was taking a position on the legislation if I did any analysis on it. So as I said, we think... Uh, we've made very clear that he should be released. We've made very clear uh, that we think he's played an important role in advancing dialogue in China. But uh, again, nothing, no position on the on the proposed legislation. Right, we'll take that as a the, now. Either the administration thinks I that think it's you a, can assume what you want, but you might be wrong. The, the administration, I don't understand this at all. The administration either thinks it's a good idea or an appropriate idea to honor him with, it, with by renaming the street in front of the embassy, or it thinks it is not appropriate, or it takes no position. You I said say, publicly we are not taking a position, which happens but, all the time with proposed legislation. All the time, Matt. This is not breaking news. Forget well, about the, the forget time. Because about sometimes the you take a very public position. Actually, it, much more often we don't take a position publicly than we do. Much more often. It is the, actually the exception to the rule that we will take a position on pending legislation. Ray, do you know who owns the street in front of the U.S. Embassy in Beijing? I don't. Do you know who owns the street in front of the, U, the Chinese I, Embassy I, in Washington? I, as you noted, I think it's been widely reported that it is the property of the federal government. Would, would you object to the Chinese doing if, if it is that the Chinese who own the street in front of the U.S. <laughs> Embassy in Beijing, would you object to them doing the same thing? Uh, I, I'm not even going to entertain the hypothetical. Really? If the Chinese decided really? they wanted to come out and rename the street in front of the Edward Snowden, at Edward Snowden <laughs> Avenue or <laughs> so, I'd be happy to have that conversation. Like that. Robert Hansen way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the Chinese government is taking all of your suggestions on board right now. I'm sure that they had them. They were in in their minds. We're just not before. at this point. I, look, going to take a public. I, I, I just can't see how it's helpful to the, well, your again, diplomacy I, I, with the Chinese not to take a position. I, I will take your advice on board, right. Matt. Let's go watch the soccer game. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And you saw the note. We're gonna, in case people want, we're gonna have it on the big screens here. Well, can we ask you about your attire so today? So people can watch the game. Yeah. She's ready. Well, tell us about why you. About my Team USA shirt. Well, tell us about why you're not in your regular professional. <laughs> this isn't professional. Um. Look, all joking aside, we've talked a lot about the fact that, look, I get we stand up here and we represent the United States, and the World Cup is a huge international event, and it's all about sports diplomacy and bringing people together, and where else can you get all these countries in one place to do something that's positive, right? And that's kind of amazing. Yeah. And, you know, I've become uh, a, a pretty big fan, so I think um, thank you for uh, giving me the pleasure of briefing early today. There is a potential that the results of today's matches could result in the United States playing Russia. Well, the there you round. go. Uh, would you Look like to that. comment on that <laughs> on that probability, or is that a hypothetical question you know, at the moment? It that is you a hypothetical, but I do think it's cool. When we're at the P5 plus one time, I mean, you know, the one thing that brings people together often is sports and is soccer and is the World Cup, and what better way uh, to talk about something positive than 
for me to wear my Team USA colors. And, you know, I'm surprised Matt's not wearing a scarf today. I, to I know. <laughs> Anyways, if you guys want to stay, we're going to show the games up here, the game up here. So grab a soda and lunch and come back. And thanks for coming Thank to today's you. briefing. Huh?